Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Kiwan Meng. Today I'm going to talk about a programming model called Alpaca, which is targeted to energy harvesting. Energy harvesting device is a device that harvests energy from its surrounding environment and store it into some sort of energy storage, which is usually a capacitor of its own, and then use that energy to perform some sort of computation. Any form of energy, such as solar, RF, motion, or heat, can be harvested and be used as a source of computation. So one interesting thing about this energy harvesting devices is that it runs intermittently only when there is available power instead of running continuously. So when the energy storage is empty, which is indicated by this cute little red icon, the device is simply off. When there is energy to harvest, the device starts to harvest the energy and slowly charges up its energy storage. You should note that in this charging period, the device is still off and no useful computation is going on. When there is enough energy, the device turns on, which is indicated by this green icon, and the device is now performing computation, and it rapidly draws energy. This is where you would do actual computation that you would desire. When the energy gets depleted, the device again turns off. All the volatile state, including register file and stack, will get erased, while the non-volatile states, such as flash or FRAM, will persist. So this charging and discharging cycle repeats until you finish your desired computation. <coughs> So you should note that the time for useful work is scarce. In our experimental setup, the charging period can go to several seconds depending on the incoming power, and the discharging cycle is usually in the order of milliseconds. So if there is certain uh, language runtime overhead in your system, which you can imagine on every reboot or power failure, we're going to expect uh, ex explain about this in more detail, which, what exactly these overheads are going to be. But if, there's, if this overheads are large, the useful work that you can do becomes really, really tiny. So obviously this is not what we want. So we should decrease the amount of overhead as much as possible while still remaining correctness of the system on this multiple power failures in between. So we present a programming model called Alpaca. But first, I'm going to uh, talk a little about the major challenges. What is the problem with the intermittent execution in general, and what is the limitation of the previous approaches? Intermittent execution impedes progress. On the left side, there is a sample code, uh, and what it does is it first go around the for loop and read sensor and fill it into a buffer. When the buffer is fully filled, it iterates through the buffer and adds all, all the value, put it in variable names. If the sum is above a certain threshold, it transmits the data. On the right side, a snapshot of the memory and one of the register, which is the program counter, is being shown. You should note that all the register and stack is, in a traditional sense, volatile. So what will happen if you just naively run this code in an energy harvesting device? You will start from the beginning of the main function, and as you execute, the memory location will get updated. And what will happen if you hit power failure? As you can see, all the memory and all the register file will, will just get erased. So if you harvest more energy, and when you reboot, you have nothing left in your register file, so you have to simply start again from the beginning of the main function. And you're going to hit power failure again. So there is an obvious problem. You can't finish the program, because whenever you hit a power failure, you just go back and start again from the beginning of the main function. So one simple solution to it is called checkpointing. So this shaded region is indicating that it has some sort of non-volatile memory location, such as FRAM or flash. So this checkpointing-based system saves the entire volatile state before it gets erased and put it into a non-volatile memory. So let's see how it solves the problem. It will start from the beginning of the main function, and it will execute as before. And before dying, when the system decides to take a checkpoint, it simply copies the entire volatile state to a non-volatile location. And after that, it will keep executing. And even if the power failure happens and all the volatile state get erased, some snapshot of the volatile state is in your non-volatile memory. So after rebooting, what the sim system simply has to do is copy back the values to the volatile state. And since the program counter is also copied along the way, instead of starting again from the main, you can just start again from where you have taken the checkpoint. So this seems to solve the problem. But the problem is, saving the entire memory and register file all the time is really expensive, especially when 
stack grow arbitrarily large. And as we have seen, if the overhead is large, the useful work that you can do becomes really tiny. So previous checkpoint-based system, Dino, it shows more than 20x uh, slowdown than plain C program. So this is not what we want. One smart programmer might ask, then what if, uh, since we have emerging new technology, which is the byte addressable non-volatile memories, what if we make our entire memory non-volatile? Will that just simply solve the problem? The answer is no, because still your register file is volatile, and now this uh, mixture of volatile and non-volatile can make your program incorrect. Let's see how it works. Now the main memory is shaded, means that the entire main memory is non-volatile. Still your register file is volatile, and you have executed your program up to this point successfully. All your buffer is filled with meaningful value, and now you're going to start summing up the values. Before doing further sum, let's assume that the program take, took a checkpoint. It now had to all just copy the register file, so it was really cheap. But uh, after taking a checkpoint, it executed the next line, and now the sum is 13. That's good. But what if we hit power failure here? After rebooting, it will simply restore the register files. But the problem is we have taken this snapshot of register file before doing the sum. So after restoring, we're going to do the sum again. Now sum is 26, which is obviously wrong. The reason that this problem happened is because this region of code is not idempotent. The section of code is called idempotent if you can execute this section of code multiple times and still get the same answer. Obviously, this section is not that important because if you run it multiple times, the sum will just keep increase. And it's the same for this I++ as well. So uh, let's take a deeper look. What is the, why this is happening? The problem is that in the non-volatile variable sum, there is a read and there is a consecutive write. And on the multiple attempt of trying to execute this line of code, the write and read chain got inverted, and the read that should have been preceding the write is actually reading the value from the previous write, because the write was non-volatile. And obviously, it has to be uh, transparent. So you can see that the read on a non-volatile memory location is causing a problem. Similar an analysis was made in a previous system, like a Dino, Ratchet, and So what we have seen so far is uh, simple approach of solving the problem in an intermittent execution is taking a checkpoint. But traditional checkpoint is really inefficient. And if you try to make it more efficient by putting entire non-volatile memory, sometimes it makes the system incorrect. So we present a new programming model called Alpaca, which doesn't rely on traditional form of checkpointing. Instead, it re relies on three key features, task-based programming model, privatization analysis by the compiler, and privatization and commit by the runtime. These three key features that I just talked about combines together to give us a speed up so that now it is actually comparable to the plain C runtime instead of having more than 20x slowdown. So let's see each feature in more detail. First, task-based programming model. To write a code in Alpaca, the programmer has to manually divide the code into multiple different sections and make each section an explicit code structure called task. In this example, the, the programmer decided to make three tasks. Task sample reads the sensor value and store the result into a buffer. Task sum sum up the buffer value and store it into a variable named sum. And task sends transmit the data if the sum is above certain threshold. And all this task explicitly passes the control flow to its next task using transition to statement. So in this example, it's, the structure is really simple. But if you, can, if you put transition to statement on multiple different, different branches, you can make arbitrarily complex program using Alpaca. And each task has to be small enough so that if you start from a fully filled energy buffer, you have to be able to at least finish one task before dying. With only that guaranteed, what the system has to do when you hit power failure in the middle of the task is simply starting over from the beginning of the task when it reboots. So it preserves progress on the granularity of tasks. And each task 
has its task shared variable and task local variable. In this example, the loop variable i, for example, is initialized within a task and only used within a task. So these ta variables are task local. It can be effectively volatile, as in traditional memory. However, the array buff and the variable sum is read and written across multiple different tasks, and the results should be preserved across the tasks. So the programmer has to annotate it as task shared in a global region, and these are allocated in a non-volatile byte addressable memory. So by reading and writing to this non-volatile task shared variable, each task can communicate its result to one another. However, now there's a problem. Because sum is now non-volatile, we have the same problem that I just showed earlier in the example. This region of code is now item potent because there is a write after read dependencies in the non-volatile memory. So we built a compiler that automatically detects this problematic behavior and inserts a code statically to solve the problem. So what, the, what this code does is our compiler first allocates a privatization buffer specific to that problematic variable which is shown as some priv. And at the beginning of the task, it copies the value of the variable sum to its privatization buffer. And instead of manipulating the variable sum directly, it is manipulating the privatized copy along the way within a task. When the task ends successfully, it uses two-phase commit mechanism to safely copy the variable back into its original location. When there is a power failure in between, you can just simply card the privatized copy and start again from the beginning of the task. So uh, I've shown you briefly how Alpaca works, and now I'm going to quickly summarize the key benefits that Alpaca has. First, uh, we don't rely on traditional form of checkpointing or rollback, so we don't have overhead of copying the entire stack or register file or memory. And instead, what we do is our compiler selectively privatize only the minimal set that is need to be privatized to make our system correct. So we incur minimal overhead. And third, uh, we can leverage volatile memory. Our task local variables can be volatile as in traditional memory. So we can use volatile memory as well as non-volatile memory. And this is in contrast to previous works some of the previous works that needs the entire memory to be non-volatile. And as you know, in a current technology, volatile memory is much faster and more energy efficient than non-volatile counterparts. So that was the main key benefits of Alpaca, and now I'll show you some experimental results. This is our experimental setup. We have a RF-powered VIS-5 hardware, which is an energy harvesting platform that harvests RF energy and use that to run TI MSP430 microcontroller. We compared to the two state-of-the-art system, which was implemented on the same um, processor, Chain and Dino, and we had six application benchmarks. Four was directly ported from Chain's paper, and we added two new from MI Bench. These are our, are our application benchmarks. I'm not going to go into everything in detail, but uh, to just give you a brief idea, Cold chain equipment monitoring reads the temperature sensor value and uses LZW compression to compress the result. Activity recognition reads the accelerometer value and yeah, uh, reads the accelerometer value and use simple machine learning to detect if it's moving or stationary. RSA encryption obviously does RSA on a string. So you can see the detail of our benchmarks in the paper. So all these application benchmarks represent the actual workload you might want to execute on a sensors built on harvesting devices. So these are our performance results measured on real harvested energy. On the x-axis, there are six application benchmarks that I have just described. Each application benchmark has three different bars. Green is the runtime of Alpaca, blue is the runtime of previous work chain, and red is the runtime for Dino. All are normalized by Alpaca's runtime, and it's lower the better. So as you can see, Alpaca is the fastest among applications without exceptions. And in some cases, it's more than seven times faster than the previous system chain, and more than 16 times faster than previous system Dino. And since stack can grow arbitrarily large, the gap can grow much more. 
now I'll go to conclusion. Alpaca is a new programming model for energy harvesting devices. It does not rely on traditional form of checkpointing. Instead, it uses compiler analysis to selectively privatize only the minimal set by write after read analysis. Due to its low overhead, it is up to seven times faster than Chain and more than 16 times faster than Dino. Uh, we couldn't get our artifacts evaluated. I really wanted that stamp right there, but <laughs> yeah, so the problem wasn't crappy, but it was because we use specialized hardware and we use specialized setup and we tried hard and our evaluators also tried hard to make that happen, but because of the tight schedule, we just couldn't ship everything and the evaluation happen. But if you go to our website, we have a web page that has all the details about the, uh, uh, how, it, how to use it and we have a fully contained VM where you can reproduce all of our results have the source code public in our GitHub page. So if you are interested, uh, visit our website. This is the end of our, my talk. Thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask.